going to be talking about precipitation processes. All right. And our learning objectives for today, I'm gonna to take these out. So first we're going to investigate um, physical processes behind precipitation formation. Um, and storm types. So this is kind of meteorology and weather. And we're going to um, understand the geographic distribution of precipitation which is not weather, but more like climate. All right, so kind of peeking under the, the, the peeking behind the curtains of weather and climate a little bit more. Um, okay. So I don't have my native app here, so I'm gonna be a little bit Clunky, can't remember how this works. Clear, great. All right, so um, as we get into it, we're going to look at four processes. Four or four steps, really. It's a four step program for precipitation formation. And this is for rain or snow, but we're gonna be talking mostly about rain up front. And the four steps, first we're going to cool. The second um, step is condensation, or yeah, I'll just say condensation, condensation. The third step is droplet formation. And then the fourth step is going to be um, importing water vapor. Basically, once you get a storm cell formed, then um, for it to continue, we need to import more water vapor from the surrounding environment. But before we get into these four steps, we're gonna kind of get back to some basics of um, kind of water physics. And this gets back to the readings that are assigned for this topic, where we look at uh, water vapor pressure and partial pressure and that sort of thing. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit, and then we'll get back to these, these four steps. So back to the basics. Um, what, when we think about water, we've got, we'll just kind of like draw a little cup right here and we've got some water in there. What do we think about the energy of the water? What kind of energy exists in this water? Okay, we got some potential energy because the water's got some elevation to it, right? Um, so we have potential energy. I'll just kind of say this is our datum, our potential. Haley, what other kind of energy do we have? Kinetic, what kind of kinetic energy? So evaporation involves kinetic energy, yep. Um, 
Is there kinetic energy just in the sitting water? What's going on inside here? We've got intermolecular forces. We've got these hydrogen molecules um, and oxygen molecules, or, or sorry, hydrogen, so water molecules. Um, and what are they doing? They're kind of bouncing around in there, right? They're vibrating or whatever they do at the atomic level. Um, so at the macroscopic level, we don't, we see kind of a still thing of glass. You look at your water bottles on the table. You don't really think of kinetic energy happening there, but we do have this kind of microscopic or molecular level kinetic energy. So our water molecules are moving around. Um, the other form of potential energy, I should say, is not only the elevation, but we also have these, these bonds, right? So you have these intermolecular bonds. So that's going to be potential energy, too, because you kind of think of it as like static, right? If you um, pull something apart, it takes energy to pull these molecules apart. And so there's some energy in those intermolecular bonds. Um, now, let's kind of think about what's going on with these mo water molecules. So let's let's look at um, our water bottles here sitting on the table or this screen. And at a given temperature, um, can water, well, I'll, we'll just say at room temperature, um, Gina, can water evaporate at room temperature? Yeah. So what's going on with that? What, what's happening at the molecular level with evaporation? They're kind of, they're jumping into the gaseous phase. Yeah. So we're, we're jumping into the gaseous phase, um, which is water vapor. And we are, um, if, we, if we close our lid on our bottle, then what happens, say, um, room temperature, everything's in equilibrium. What's going on between um, the kind of air and the water? We're losing to the water. And if you open that up, you probably see some condensation inside, right? And so it's condensing back out, back into the water. So we, we establish this equilibrium. If we put a, a cover over this and seal it up, we'll establish um, some, um, what's known in here as vapor pressure. Um, or water vapor will just enter the atmosphere inside this water bottle. And vapor pressure is the pressure that the water exerts on the atmosphere. This water vapor is exerting on the atmosphere. And we denote it as, um, E. So see this term E in your textbook in the readings. And so we can define vapor pressure as the partial pressure of water vapor in the atmosphere. So ATM atmosphere. So the pressure in the atmosphere, we looked at, we kind of did hydrostatics or we kind of looked at this concept, but pressure in the atmosphere is gonna be pressure of dry air, which is composed of oxygen and carbon dioxide and nitrogen and trace gases, as well as water vapor. Water vapor is a big component, gaseous component of our atmosphere. And so this pH2O is that E, that little lowercase e, the um, vapor pressure. So we kind of fundamentally understand that, well, dry air is quote unquote thirstier, right? And so we can probably more readily evaporate water into dry air. Um, and we also probably know that as things heat up, things evaporate more quickly. So the idea is that air, um, can receive water, water vapor, based on the relative humidity or how much water vapor is already in the air and its temperature. And so I'll introduce a new term, which is saturated vapor pressure. And 
and this is E star. And saturated vapor pressure is the maximum potential water vapor the atmosphere can hold. at a given temperature. And we can look at a relationship for saturated water vapor pressure. There's kind of a physically based equation that says E star, which we could represent in Pascal's is um, a function of temperature. And this could be um, Celsius or Kelvin. And it kind of looks like this. It's kind of like a nonlinear relationship, like a hockey stick kind of a thing. Um, and of course, air can hold water below zero degrees Celsius. But once we get above that, we get into this kind of highly nonlinear relationship. Um, if you were to kind of fit a line in the region of temperatures that we experience on the surface of our planet, then you could say, linearly speaking, if you want to approximate it, we get about 6% more E or partial pressure per degree Celsius. So every time we increase Celsius, we can get a little bit more, but you can see it's nonlinear. And so for hotter temperatures, you can get more water. So we get 6% more water vapor pressure per degree Celsius. And that's important when we talked about things getting hotter, the air has greater potential. So saturated vapor pressure is a theoretical maximum, right? And we don't necessarily reach that all the time. But for a given temperature, if there's enough water around, be it an ocean or a river or just all the grass and trees and rivers and streams around us, then the air can hold much more water vapor. And that's important because ultimately this is the water that could precipitate out into rain. Um, and so we talked about ascribing um, climate change signature in something like Hurricane, um, the one that fell over Houston. I'm already forgetting the name. Harvey. 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 Yep. And I think I can't remember exactly what the study found, but they did this modeling exercise. This, you know, this equations in there for saturated vapor pressure. Well, yeah, because base, if we compared it to 1983 averages, we're five degrees hotter or something for that particular time, then this much, I think they estimate about 20% more water vapor was in the air. And so the rainfall was like 20% worse, essentially. Um, okay, so now we're kind of, we know saturated vapor pressure. Let's get into like actual conditions. Uh, this is a theoretical maximum, right? I'm going to clear everything. And we're going to think about relative humidity, which is something that we experience. <laughs> and relative humidity <clears throat> is the ratio of actual vapor pressure. So what's actually in the atmosphere? So that's E to saturated vapor pressure. which is E star. So relative humidity, we'll just say our H is equal to E over E star. So when you say it's 90% uh, uh, humidity right now, that means that we're really close to that maximum level, 100%. Well, um, you can't get above that. So uh, I, th I guess that's probably not true. I'm sure there's some conditions we can get super saturated, right? That's, a, that's an actual thing. Um, and then the last term we'll introduce before we get into the precipitation um, processes is this term dew point. Has anyone you've heard this before, dew point? Do you kind of know what that is? Maybe Simone will ask you, do you have an understanding what dew point is? 
I've definitely heard the term before, but I don't recall what it means. Is that, um, does that have to do like when it's cold in the morning and there's condensation on all of the grass and the plants, something, yeah. something with that? So we know that um, if there's water vapor in the atmosphere and what happens overnight that results in dew? It cools, okay, right? And you wake up, if you're camping and your tent's, you know, covered in water or the grass, you walk across the grass, you get your shoes wet. Um, and so it's the temperature at which condensation occurs. So the units of dew point is temperature. Um, and to kind of be a little more specific here, so that's kind of like, okay, the temperature which compensation occurs. So the temperature, and I could say also the temp to which a parcel of air with a given vapor or given water vapor content, given E, so water vapor content must cool to reach saturation. So that's kind of another way of thinking about it. We have to, we have this parcel of air, it has a certain humidity in it or, or water vapor content in it. What is the temperature we have to cool it so that we reach saturating conditions, at which point condensation occurs. Once we reach saturation, then that water vapor is looking to come out of the air and condense on some surface. And so it's uh, often used as a measurement of water vapor content in the air. You have relative humidity, dew point also gives you that kind of information and you can convert between the two. All right, so we've got this understanding of water vapor content in the air, saturated water vapor, um, or saturating conditions, relative humidity. Let's go back to our four steps of precipitation formation. In our four step program, first step is cooling. And let's think about how, and so obviously we're talking about air. We need to cool air down, right? Air has water vapor in it. Um, it's not necessarily at its dew point. And so we need to cool it down so that condensation can occur. What are some ways air can cool? And I'll ask you first, Simone, and we'll go around. Uh, could How does anything um, cool? That loses energy. Yeah. How do we lose energy? How does how does a uh, we'll just think of like something sitting on a table. How does it lose energy if it's like a kettle of hot water? Uh, it dissipates into the environment. Okay. So we can radiate, right? radiate and that's uh, remember that black body um, process where you have anything that has a temperature above zero degrees kelvin radiates energy it's typically uh, at the temperatures we deal with it's typically infrared energy so ready radiate energy um, to surroundings right to the air around this okay um, how about another one, Sam? What's another way we can like, dissipate energy? Like what, like cool. The frontal method, is that what you're looking for? Okay, yeah. What's the, what's happening there? Uh, let's see, we're approaching the particular side of the mountain and going higher up uh, into the air. And uh... <laughs> So as, as air rises, what's happening to it? How does it actually cool? <clears throat> That's okay. That's actually the topic of our of our um, yeah. thing here. So yeah, just, heat, rises. Heat, heat rises, rises, right? Let's put a pin on that, but um, we could have, um, we could have, so just some other ways, right? So we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to the rising thing, but we, we have conduction. So um, 
Conduction is, is a radi radiation process, right? And this could be conduction with land. And we could also just have mixing, right? Ah, uh, yeah. So mixing, this could be convection. What was I saying? Is convection through like fluids? So convection is um, kind of, you know, mass movement, right? So uh, you have a temperature gradient, convection, so the, the mass of air is actually moving, rising, and typically. Um, conduction is just, you have warm air touching land. And so you can have conduction from land to air or air to land. Um, so it's just like, you know, just contacts essentially. And um, a lot of these things could aid, you know, in cooling things down, but ultimately these won't produce storms. Although convection, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so we need some kind of bigger drivers of, of cooling. And what Sam was talking about is, is air parcels moving, right? To different um, elevations. So how can we get that to happen? Well, um, convection is one way we can take a hot air mass and it can rise. Um, and then we talked about orographic uplift. We'll get into that in a little more detail. Um, but ultimately we need to move warm air to cooler regions. Up. And as warm air moves up, we'll talk about mechanisms later for how this happens. Um, the air expands because the pressure is decreasing as you go up, right? So we go from this to this. And going back to thermo, what happens when a gas expands? We hold everything else constant. What happens to the energy or to the temperature in it? The temperature goes down. And this is called um, adiabatic cooling. This is the um, really important process, thermodynamic process. So if we think of this as a closed system, so heat does not enter or leave the control volume, the gas just expands and it expands because it's you know going in elevation. So it's, um, we have less pressure on that. Um, and as it expands, it cools. This is a you know, fundamental principle behind air conditioning or one of them. So the adiabatic process and vertical uplift obviously is the primary mechanism of expansion of our air. Vertical uplift, this could come from convection. It could come from orographic, meaning mountains, right? And we could also get it from frontal systems. So warm air over cool air or vice versa. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But we know that as warm air or as air expands, it cools. If you think about our propane tank on our grill and we got that open and you're frying up those hamburgers, you touch the grill and then maybe there's even frost on it, right? Because that gas is expanding. Um, when you pump your bike tire up, you feel the, um, kind of tube that goes to your bike, that's really warm because we're compressing the gas. Um, so that's, that's an important process there. All right, so we've got cooling. We know that we, we cool primarily through adiabatic cooling. That's the big, big ticket cooling mechanism there. Um, and then we'll go on to our next step, which is, I'm gonna go ahead and clear that. Step two, condensation. All right. Um, and we know that um, once we cool, cool air to dew point, 
This is when water condenses, meaning we go from water vapor to liquid water. All right, so that's great. Um, but, um, and, and I guess a couple of points on condensation is when, so what happens with, to water? What happens to your skin when your sweat evaporates off your arm or, yeah. Temperature. Evaporative cooling. Yeah. Right. Why, why, why does your skin cool when water evaporates off of it? Because the water um, absorbs the heat in it. So from... What's that? I'm just saying what's the mm -hmm. absorbing Evaporation. Yeah, it has, and it's taking energy with it, right? So evaporation, we're going from liquid, which has a certain, well, if we say, um, Let's see here. Um, we'll say energy. And then this is um, temp or something like that, right? So if we're, if we're at the liquid phase right here, we have so much energy, just kinetic energy in the water. And then as we evaporate, we're really elevating the energy level of the water because to go from liquid to gas, there's a lot more energy in there. And so that water vapor, when it evaporates off your skin and goes up into the atmosphere is taking a lot of heat energy with it because um, it's going to this elevated energy level. And so it, by taking that heat, it's basically kind of using your body's heat as its rocket fuel and it's taking it with it as it goes up into space. So it takes that heat with it. But when it, that, so this is evaporation, but when we go back to condensation, um, then we're putting that heat back into the environment. So the heat, is it just in the um, kinetic energy of the, of the molecules? And then that is transported or transferred back to heat energy um, at condensation. So condensation, adds heat energy to the atmosphere. All right, so that's nice. It's warming things up as we have this condensation. So the air rises, it cools, it condenses, and then we have condensation, which then adds heat to the atmosphere. So that um, warm air, rises more so we can encourage more uplift from that heat that's being added. And we get a positive feedback here. Which leads to more condensation. Isn't that nice? That's just kind of like, it's obviously it's not perpetual motion here. We get condensation, you know, we have to kind of encourage the uplift to happen initially. So there's some energy there. Um, but then we get this nice positive feedback of condensation adding heat. So that we have, we're basically going from kinetic energy or the energy of the movement of the water vapor molecules, going to heat energy, warming the air, more rising happening. And so you can think of, if you watch a storm cell, you can think of this like cycle, right? So condensation is happening in the middle. There's more uplift happening and it keeps going. All right, so that's all great. Um, but here's one of the kickers. We, we, we can have condensation, but we need actual droplets to form. It turns out that it takes um, 10 to the eight water molecules. to make a droplet of water that can form precipitation, meaning it can fall out of the cloud, right? You can think of there's all this wind and the water has to be able to make it all the way down 
um, and not evaporate on its way down. This is obviously not a, a firm number, right? It depends on temperature and wind, and it depends on relative humidity, et cetera. But it's, it's obviously a big number. We need billion plus molecules, right? Um, and the chance of all of those little molecules forming together or like hitting is minuscule because it's just kind of randomly, they all have to, to line up. And so ultimately we need what Sam referred to as we need condensation nuclei. Um, to encourage or catalyze droplet formation. And what could be that be? What would that look like? Yeah. Yeah, it could be dust, could be ice crystals that are in there. Um, and sometimes we can add um, human, we'll just say kind of human uh, derived smog, right? Um, or it could be something that we seed into the clouds. And so we'll look at um, cloud seeding. So ultimately we need, want, want to create large quote unquote, droplets that can fall to the ground. Spread across Colorado's high country hills, machines like this are planting snow seeds in the clouds. Cloud seeding does not create new weather, but it's a way to work with the weather passing through Colorado and get a little more snow from every event. Snow is critical to Colorado. It's the primary source of our state's water supply. That's why the state of Colorado, the Colorado River District, three ski areas, and the Front Range Water Council, including Denver Water, help fund the Central Colorado Mountains River Basin cloud seeding program. This is silver iodide. This is what we use for cloud seeding. It's a naturally forming element. So this is put in a solution tank and sprayed over a propane flame. The program uses two high elevation, remotely operated generators and more than 20 manually operated machines. So we pressurize our tank and then we carefully light our chimney. Generators vaporize the silver iodide and winds lift the material into the clouds when conditions are right for enhancing snowfall. Silver iodide adds additional particles to help harvest the atmospheric water. So then you have the six-sided particle floating along in cloud, vapor starts to build on it, and when enough is added to that particle, it will turn into a snowflake and fall out. The program seeds clouds over Eagle, Grand, Pitkin, and Summit counties to boost snowpack in the Upper Colorado River Basin. Breckenridge, Keystone, and Winter Park ski areas help fund the program as well to generate extra snow at their resorts. Over the past 30 years, Winter Park Resort has participated in some type of cloud seeding program. When the storm system comes in, we are able to turn on the cloud seeding generators and that can bring an additional one, two inches, three inches of snowfall. The benefit to the additional snowfall is important for the recreational resources, and it's a benefit to Denver Water because it's an additional amount of water that melts in the springtime for water users. Mountain Snowpack provides over 80% of water supply for Denver, so we're always interested in looking at options that could create more snow. While it's hard to pinpoint exactly how much snow is produced by cloud seeding, data suggests that it has been successful. So we continue to work with our partners on the east slope and the west slope to invest in cloud seeding. You cannot seed every cloud that comes through Colorado. There's a window of opportunity for cloud seeding. We're trying to catch that part of the storm that's cold enough with a lot of liquid water in it. Studies support the benefit of cloud seeding when proper atmospheric conditions exist. You can get about 5 to 15 percent more snowpack from good machines burning a high silver rate and a wet juicy storm. Estimates from Western weather consultants show how small amounts of additional snow over wide areas add up over the course of the winter. 
Over the last few seasons, we've estimated that within the CCMRB program that we've been able to produce on average around 60,000 additional acre feet of water for the entire area. There is this kind of rich history of the lure of we can help with the clouds. We don't know everything, but we do know what types of clouds to seed, what material we should be using, and that it's not a cure-all, but it's gonna add more to the system and be helpful. We'll talk about snow and snow hydrology and all that um, in a week or two, but I wanted to kind of give you an introduction to cloud seeding, condensation nuclei, often um, we can encourage more snow and more rain uh, by adding dust essentially. And this is specialized dust. And he talked about six-sided, um, I'll just go back to this and pause it. Six-sided uh, molecule. And I believe that shape is, is also kind of the same shape as crystalline water. And so the snowflake is able to kind of naturally form from the shape of that um, silver iodide molecule that they use. Um, so then we'll talk about the Grand Mesa as well. There's a similar program on the Mesa that the city and uh, local irrigator groups fund that program. Yeah, and Simone got to go out and see it. All right. Um, we'll do, let's see here. Let's do our last. Let's do our last process here and then we'll get back to that. All right, so droplet formation, we can encourage that. And then our last process is importation. Of more water vapor. A single, uh, a single storm as it forms might have, um, we'll just say a single storm cell might have about one centimeter of precipitable water. Water in it. So it starts, you know, you start that process, maybe it's a convective storm, it's really hot. So air rises, cools, condenses, droplet formation happens. But if it's just with that air content within that storm, there's not gonna be a ton of water that um, can actually fall out as rain. But we know that thunderheads as they go can drop a lot of rain down. So um, thunderstorms must recruit more water vapor. Um, to continue, right? They wanna grow up to be a big storm. They need more water. And there's a lot of ways that can happen. And we can kind of think of a storm cell that forms and there's a good graphic and you're reading. So here's the lands, here's, um, you know, we have, Convection that causes the air to rise, the air rises and then it cools and we get condensation and then we get droplet formation and you kind of get this cycle, right? So there's air rising, there's rain falling down here and then we have air rising. But um, as that air rises, it can also suck in more air from around. And so we can recruit more water vapor locally as this storm forms and gets bigger and taller and can kind of suck more air in. So that's kind of one way you kind of just hoover up the nearby water vapor. I'm gonna show you a graphic though. That's Colorado's high country. I can get to the next slide. And this is a graphic showing um, water vapor that is being recruited from the Pacific Ocean. So here's the Pacific Ocean. The sun's shining down, heating the water up. There's a lot of water vapor. So the orange and yellows is, is the water vapor. 
And then we've got these kind of continental scale cycles. So here's a low pressure front that's turning counterclockwise and then high pressure over here. And that's causing the wind and the kind of continental scale wind to suck that water vapor up into the continent. And this is actually what happened in 2013. And this massive amount of water vapor, um, essentially a hose or a, a fire hydrant of water vapor got brought up into Colorado and then slammed against the mountains. And so that um, plus, so this huge source of water vapor that was imported from thousands of miles away was um, essentially the, the lifeline or the fuel for that massive flood event that happened in 2013 on the Front Range. All right. Um, and then screen share, whiteboard. Great. All right, so that's the, the four-step program. And now we'll talk about different kinds of storm types that we have. And essentially when we think of storm types, we're thinking of different ways that we can uplift air parcels to, condense, to cool them adiabatically as they expand to cause condensation and ultimately droplet formation. Um, and the first type we'll talk about is frontal, frontal storms, also known as extratropical, meaning outside of the tropics. Um, extratropical cyclones. And we saw the spinning uh, air masses, the kind of low pressure front, high pressure fronts. Those are what are known as cyclones. because they spin, right? Um, but not necessarily like a torn or a hurricane, that kind of thing. Um, we've got cold fronts, which are part of that. So cold front. And this is where we have cold air moving into warm air. And what happens when we have that is you can think of, we've got this pocket of warm air that's kind of sitting around an area. <coughs> and then we have cold air coming in and th they don't mix immediately. And so the front means that you're gonna basically, the air is gonna, because they have different densities, the air is gonna move up and uplift over that. Now, that might not feel intuitive because warm air rises, but when you have two different densities of things coming together, then one's gonna um, not necessarily mix perfectly well. These are, some, these are typically kind of small, intense, small in terms of area, intense storms. And we could have cold fronts moving in, they dump a bunch of snow or rain on us, and then they leave this kind of clear, sunny conditions. Follow. Um, then we also have warm fronts. which is the same idea, but in this case, it's just warm over cold air. It typically occurs over a larger area. So it's less intense as well. So fronts are really important. Um, and the idea is the, the different temperature air masses don't mix immediately. And so uplift occurs as one slides over the other. Now we have um, tropical cyclones, which we're familiar with. I'm not gonna talk about how they work because it's not really a Western thing, but you can read about that in Dingman if you're interested. 
Dingman 4.1.3. And so I provided a reading on Canvas for that. Now, convective is probably what you all are most familiar with. Convective storms happen because we have surface heating, so the land warms up. Warm air rises. And we get uplift through convection, right? And these are our afternoon thunderstorms. Of course, every day in the summertime, the land warms up and air gets hot and rises. But if we don't have the appropriate amount of water vapor in the air, then we won't get rainstorms. So our monsoon season, which we'll talk about in a second, happens because it's hot, so air is rising, but we also get this moisture supply um, and we need that as well for rainstorms to happen. The last type of storm, and we talked about this already, but orographic. So oro is um, related to mountains, or topographic. And this is also known as topographic uplift. So we'll just say topographic uplift. We've got air that's moist, hits a mountain range or some lift. And as it rises, we get rainfall on that side of the mountain. Of course, it can happen, in our case, it can happen on the front range as well, but our jet stream goes from west to east, and so we get um, often more precipitation or uh, on average, especially in the snow, the winter months on the western side of the mountains because of orographic uplift. And this or orographic or topographic uplift is what leads to our long-term kind of climate. So convection, rainstorms, right? That's a little bit more of a weather phenomenon. Topographic uplift, granted, you're not going to get a rainstorm every day, but on average creates wetter conditions on, um, the, up in the mountains and on the western side of the mountains. We also see that over here on the Cascade Range. Um, the Sierra Nevada mountains as well. They're catching a lot of that water vapor that comes off of the Pacific Ocean. So here's zooming into Colorado where we have our um, annual average precipitation and um, a lot of it's falling up in the mountains where at some point you're going high enough for condensation to occur and rain to come out. So that's why it rains more in the mountains rather than down here. Um, and that's contrasted with the 100 year 24 hour precipitation map. These are weather events or storm events. So this is this is, shows the kind of accumulation of snow and rain in the mountains, which, which is pre preferentially on the western side of the continental divide. Here we're seeing storm tracks. And so um, the blue and green colors are, are deeper storm events or more rainfall. And those are concentrated on the front range here and then in the Western Plains. Out here, of course, we do get storm events, but they're much smaller or, or um, not as much rain in terms of depth. So we're looking at about two inches for the 100 year, 24 hour duration storm event out in Boulder and Fort Collins, we're looking at five to six inches. And that plays out in our flood intensity we have bigger floods where we have bigger rain events. And so the front range is where our big dumps of rain are concentrated. And the season for that is typically late fall, late summer and, and early fall. Um, and I'll show you again why that is in a minute. Um, but that, that comes down to where water vapor is coming from and what is driving the uplift. 
So monsoon rainfall plays out across the world and it is most known to occur in the subcontinent of India, Pakistan, where we have a huge amount of water vapor coming up against these massive mountains, which you can see is over you know, 14,000 feet. They don't talk about 14ers in the Himalayas, they talk about 16ers and how, how tall is Mount Everest? Is it 20,000 feet? Yeah, it's very high, right? So this is just a really huge topographic uplift here. And the, some of the biggest rivers and most volume of water that flows out comes in the Indus and Ganges river system that drain the Himalayan mountains. Um, Pakistan's been in the news recently because the monsoon season was incredible. It started really early and it's been so long and so hard. Um, and thousands of people, or I think over a thousand people have died. Millions have been displaced. Um, it it's, was in the news about last week about it. Um, so the monsoon season there is extending and becoming more severe. We also have the monsoon season here. It's a little bit more subdued. It's very important for water in the West in the summertime, keeping our temperatures cooler, keeping fires from happening. Um, the huge 2020 fire season that we had was because we essentially didn't have a monsoon season. We just didn't have the rain that we normally get in the summer. We've had about an average monsoon season this year. It's felt really wet. In fact, it's just been about average. And that monsoon season happens when we have essentially um, low and high pressure systems that bring water up. You can see how this is spinning counterclockwise, this is spinning clockwise. That's drawing air up from the Pacific Ocean where it gets a lot of water vapor and causes rainfall over the Southwest. So really important for the Southwest. And this map shows where um, the percent of average annual precipitation falls in the July and August months when the monsoon season typically happens. And so um, up to 50% of rainfall in Southern Arizona and New Mexico, 30% here, and then in Colorado, somewhere around 10 to 20% of our precipitation comes in the summer season. So it's really important for a number of reasons, but also can cause big flooding and debris flows and stuff like that. So here's that graphic again. This is a monsoon type of event where water vapor is being sucked up from the Pacific. And in this case, um, it fell out uh, mostly on the front range here. So this just, you know, where the system set up can, can drive where that kind of fire hose of water vapor shows up. Does it show up in Western Colorado or Eastern Colorado? And in this case, it came up into um, the front range and then came against the mountains and then just dumped and dumped and dumped for weeks. So Estes Park, typically, you know, it's at 8,000, 9,000 feet, doesn't get really extreme rainfall, but Estes Park had just catastrophic floods, uh, which was pretty pretty new for that area, pretty unprecedented. All right, so that is, let me just see if I got anything else I wanna say about precipitation. Yeah. That is our lecture on precipitation processes. The last thing I'll say about monsoons is that um, it's a combination of things, right? It's, it's a sourcing of water vapor. We need to have water vapor present for monsoons to happen. Um, they could happen from convective processes. So afternoon thunderstorms, just because it's more humid here. Um, and they can also happen because of orographic or typographic uplift.